Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 7th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we question whether the governor really is serious about passing SJR 6, the proposed PFD constitutional amendment. Second, we explain why Representative Zach Fields is complaining about the wrong set of Republicans in his recent Anchorage Press op-ed. And third, we explain why the ADN's headline about the reverse sweep is misleading. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's talk about the weekly top three. Um, and first and foremost, we're going to get into this thing with fields that we were talking about. But the governor put out an article in Must Read Alaska uh, earlier in the week. And, um, and, and I read the article. And l- let me just quickly, before you jump into it, let me just say this. Um, the article is all well and good. But my question is, Governor, if you were really serious about SJR 6, why, oh, why would you do the big dog and pony show with all the legislators behind you and then disappear uh wouldn't appear on the program couldn't be bothered to have time couldn't do this went bear hunting instead did all these other things why aren't you out there working it like a redheaded stepchild why aren't you out there pressing the flesh and cajoling the legislators face to face why aren't you doing all that so that that's my comment on it and i'm gonna let you go <laughs> well that's 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 a good comment i mean the bear hunting especially is a is is something that you got to wonder about uh during the last week of the legislative session i mean we hired him to do a job right the job is to be governor right i mean gov- governor is i the, don't is begrudge be, anybody be being capital. i don't begrudge anybody being able to go out there and you know hunt and fish and do all that but there's a time and a place for it and if he says as he says in this article there's a vanishingly small window why would you take a week out of time to go do this and go hunting instead? I mean, there's always going to be the next year's hunt. Yep. Well, my my issue with the with the article and my issue with with the the way the governor is pressing forward on this on 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 the SJR six right now is is this. It even the Republicans, even Shelley Hughes, and Mike Shower have made clear that in order to get SJR six through. We're going to have to resolve the revenue issue at the same time. The substitute revenues that will that will plug the hole uh, that, uh, that 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 is created by you know complying with the law and, and and paying a PFD, and that that hole isn't going to go away. I know the governor's got res- rosy economic forecasts that you know predict that uh, the hole disappears. But that's based on oil prices that the futures market doesn't believe in. It's based on production levels that uh, uh, that haven't been sanctioned, uh, that, that there isn't investment for uh, yet. It's based on uh, uh, permanent fund uh, earnings growth that that no one else seems to believe in, uh, including me. And so it's it, so that economic forecast that he's using is just is just. I mean, we need to we need to throw that in the in the trash bin and 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 face up to the fact that that's that's a far stretch budget uh, that, that that does not have a, a reasonable basis in the in the real world right now right um, and and so we've got to have revenues and 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 if the governor was really serious if if he truly wanted to press forward on SJR6 he would get he would have a full package he would have this is SJR6 this is the solution on the permanent fund dividends this is the revenue package don't want to do it uh, uh, wish we didn't have to do it, but, 
this is you know the this is the level of government that the legislature has decided this is the, le- the level of government that we're that we're going forward with and so we need revenues to close this in order to have sjr6 in order to stop the legislature from continuing to tax pfds as a way of closing it um and but he's not doing that what he what he's doing is saying sjr6 sjr6 and oh yeah revenue thing the legislature needs to needs to figure that out well <laughs> He's elected governor. I mean, he, you know, for good, bad, or indifferent, he's governor. And governors are elected to lead. And governors have a responsibility to balance a budget. And part of balancing a budget is to have revenues uh, that, that equal expenditures. And, and, you know, that's one of his responsibilities to propose a budget, to propose uh, mechanisms that, uh, that, that close uh, that, uh, that gap, uh, close the deficit gap. And and so I, I get the sense, uh, and I get the sense that what's going on here is really the first part of the governor's 2022 campaign. It's I'm for the PFD. It, it, it's very reminiscent of the of the 2018 campaign. I'm for the PFD. I'm going to get you a PFD. Elect, you know, go my route, and we're going to get a PFD. Um, but without. <laughs> With, without really providing a basis for how we're going to get that PFD. I mean, during the 2018 campaign, it was, I will get you a full PFD. I will get you a payback of the last PFD. The governor doesn't have that authority. The governor has to create a budget that would be able to do that. And, and it never, it, he never gelled in being able to do that. And, and so it, it sounds like the, it's beginning to sound like the same thing. It's beginning, it's beginning to sound like the campaign pitch uh, for 2022. If he's it, and he doesn't want to talk about revenues because then you know people are going to say, oh my God, the governor proposed revenues and 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 you know the the the, the reaction of that is going to be this governor's in favor of revenues. We got to vote against the governor. There's going to be you know another candidate uh, that says we don't need a, we don't need no revenues. So it's so it sounds like it sounds like a campaign pitch. If he if he really was serious about SJR six, if this was really a pitch. To, to truly enact SJR6, to truly get this problem resolved, as Shelley Hughes, as, as Mike Schauer, as, as others have said, you're going to have to have revenues. And, and, govern, and the governor needs to be part, needs to lead that revenue discussion uh, to get it across the line. You're not going to find legislators who are able to agree on you know, whether it's daylight out or dark uh, uh, on on revenues without the governor being part of that conversation, they're all going to be posturing uh, about about the the revenue issue as long as as long as it doesn't look realistic, and as long as the governor's not part of the conversation, it's not going to be a realistic. So, my my question after reading this article was: Are you are you serious? Is the governor really serious about trying to get uh, SJR six and trying to get the PFD? Uh, across the line, and I don't see it. I don't see that serious, that level of seriousness yet, until the governor steps up and actually uh, starts talking about seriously talking about revenues. Right. No, I mean I would agree. I think he's got to talk about revenues, and he's got to engage. I mean, it goes back to what I was just saying before. I've had conversations with multiple legislators and staffers that have all said. You know, we're not seeing him. He's not down here talking to us. He's not down here, you know, pounding the proverbial pavement, so to speak, knocking on doors and talking to people and saying, can I get your support? Can I, you know, can I count on you? Can you do? He's not working with him. It's like he's, he's, you know, and I guess somebody said to me, they said, well, you know, it's not his style. He's not real. And I'm like, look, you took the job. I don't care if it's your style or not. You've got a piece of legislation which you were able to gather people together to agree on. Now you got to go out and sell it to those who don't agree with it. That's how the process works. Get up off your rusty dusty, put the hunting rifle away, and go out there and engage the legislature, but engage the people as well. At least he's starting to try and talk to the people. But, I mean, this thing's been on the table for four weeks. Where have you been? Yeah, it's... Um... <laughs> it's he's got to engage both personally and he's got to engage on the full issue uh i i i i, I think we're saying different pieces of the same yes of, of the same puzzle here yeah he's got to engage he's got to engage people he's got to engage legislators he's got to you know have that have that level of 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 personal engagement in the process plus he's got to engage on the full issues he's got to he's got to engage 
uh, on the revenue side of it as well. You know, just just launching this out there, launching these things out there, and then standing back, just you know, just reinforces the 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 view or or my my suspicion that this is much more a campaign tool than it is a an intentional. Uh, let's see if we can get this done. Right. Uh, uh, proposal. Well, I mean, can't you read the room? I mean, at this point, Mike, can't you read the room to say people are not happy? I mean, you promise one thing. If you had solutions, including even new revenues, it might make some people mad, but at least there would be some engagement. He should, I mean, the problem is this is a longstanding issue. He should have been engaging the people in the legislature for a lot you know, for the for the entire time he's been in office, but it's just not happened. All right. So anyway, it's I mean, I'm beating a dead horse here, but I agree with you. I think this this comes off more as a campaign issue, which I think is ridiculous, but uh, it should be should be deeper. This is a problem, I think, with all politicians right now is that nobody wants to face uh, the music. Um, it whether it's whether it's at the state level, whether it's at the national level, it just seems like nobody wants to t- take the bull by the horns and say, "Hey, look, we we got we got ourselves a problem here." Um, instead, they want to always focus on some other issue that came up or whatever. And and I think I think this is this is the this is the second part of the typical politician's disease at this point. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's disappointing. I mean. We, we 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 have run out of savings. We we are we are facing uh, uh, continued challenges on the oil side uh, in terms of revenues. In terms of you know when you look at the at the at the long term declining oil prices, declining uh, production. Um, we're out of savings. We're 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 at the you know we're at the very edge of the cliff. Uh, we need to be resolving these issues. I think there is generally a public understanding that we need to be resolving these issues. But part of the resolution is is a hard part. Part of the resolution is deciding on replacement revenues for continuing to use PFD cuts, deciding on a more equitable approach for how to deal with the deficits than, than continuing to use the approach that has the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and, and that's hard. I mean, the governor could. This is all about framing. The governor could 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 do a be, a much better job of framing the issue, and then say, "I'm going to step in, and I'm going to, you know, we're going to have to address this issue." And I'm call the legislative leaders together, uh, and have a, a summit around how are we going to address uh, uh, address revenues? How are we going to address replacement revenues? We've had enough with PFD cuts. Uh, he could take all sorts of steps. Um, as governor, I think to to be a leader on the issue. But but not only is he not being a leader on the issue, he's abdicating the issue. I mean, he's yes. he's continu- continuing yes. to say, yeah, revenues, yeah, that's a legislative thing. I'm not going to yeah. get into that. I, he's just abdicating the, the the facing up to the fact that that's got to be part of the solution. Well, and he's kind of he's been very a hands off kind of governor in that way in a lot of ways. He'll throw the proposal out there and then scurry back for cover. Uh, same thing happened in 2018. He really didn't fight for the budget. You know, same thing happened when the special session got called in Wasilla. He scurried back and kind of, you know, he's it's like he throws these things out there like there's some kind of test poll and then and then doesn't really he doesn't really come back and, and fight. That's the thing. I guess that's what gets me. He's not a fighter. It doesn't appear to me, and, and this is just again my personal opinion, it doesn't appear to me that he truly is passionate and believes about the proposals he's throwing out there at, at, at almost everything that he's done. He throws it out there. He kind of let's see how it sticks in the wind. And then he scurries back to a position that's halfway back to where he was to begin with. That's kind of, it seems like what's going on. Yeah. And in this situation, Michael, it's not like he even has to, you know, he's not even the first mover in this. Shelley, Shelley Hughes and Mike Shower have gone on record saying there need to be revenues. David Wilson has gone on record saying, there, there need to be revenues, that it's an incomplete package. You can't move SJR6 forward. You can't consider this piece of it without, without a complete package. It's not, like, it's not like he has to plow that ground. The senators, Republican senators, conservative Republican senators, have plowed that ground for him. All he has to do is step on the field and say, okay, that's got to be part of the solution. I understand that. Here's a proposal to do that. 
It's not going to be it's not going to be what's finally approved, but let's start negotiating on it because it's got to be a complete package. It's it's he's not he doesn't even have to be the first mover. Shower and Hughes and Wilson have already stepped out there. Um, uh, the Valley reps have already stepped out there uh, to to do that. And, you know, and and so it's it's really a fairly easy thing for him to do, but he's got to do it. The governor's got to be at the table. The governor's got to be part of part of the discussion. And, and articles like what he did in Must Read is just, I mean, he's only dealing with half the issue and saying, you know, I'm for, we're going to push this forward. Well, Governor, if you're going to push it forward, you're going to have to push revenues forward um, as part of it as well. And your own Republican senators are telling you that you're going to have to do that and that they're they're ready to, to, to listen to what to, to your ideas on it. Right. Absolutely. Robbie in the chat room says the governor was on Lars Larson last night. OK. God dang it. I mean, this is great. Great. He was on large. You know, the governor put the proposal out, SGR 6, that afternoon or that next, that evening, maybe the next morning. I was on the blower with his people, like, okay, get him on the program. Let's talk about it. Let's fight about it. Let's get this. And, you know, for three or four days, I kind of got the runaround. Oh, this is, he can't. He's flying. He's doing this. He's doing it. Next thing you know, he's out for a week hunting. I mean, come on. Go on, Lars Larson. How does that help you with your, I mean, uh, uh, th- th- again, this just proves, and I think more than anything, he's in campaign mode. He's not. He's not really serious about this. He's not really serious. Number two is this piece that I was just talking about from Zach Fields in the Anchorage Press. Um, uh, by, you know, first of all, it got printed in the press, which is very friendly territory for these guys. So I already took that with a grain of salt. But this idea of throwing. Uh, Donna Ardwin under the bus to begin with. I mean, that was the first thing that struck me. And the second thing to go on and talk about things like, I mean, this is the same guy that was talking about, you know, using words like draconian and apocalyptic. And now he's using jihad against public services. Well, at the same time, the hypocrisy just drips from this article with a combination of it's the law. Can you believe it's the law? Can you believe the governor wants to break the law? I'm looking at you like, what? I mean, did do you even hear the words that are coming out of your pie hole? Um, what are your thoughts on number two? Well, Zach is Zach is fighting a straw man. He's fighting some. He's fighting, you know, this 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 made up um, uh, uh, vision of of what the governor is up to up to, uh, and and trying to you know count coup uh, in the <clears throat> in the sense that the Native Americans used to count coup, trying to count coup against a, against this straw man and you know make himself look. Uh, make himself look strong. The truth is the 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 budget proposal are, are arguing 1.0, the budget proposal <laughs> of 2019 didn't go through. The governor the governor didn't ultimately wasn't able to, you know, get 16 to back him up on the vetoes. Didn't make the level of vetoes that uh, that that he essentially said he was going to in the original budget proposal and hasn't gone back there again. He hasn't ma- he hasn't proposed cuts. The subsequent budgets have all been much higher, much more been in line with the level of spending that got approved at the end of uh, at the end of the session in in 2019, and 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 this cuts budget that that Zach rails against in the in the article. You know, this is the governor's trip. It doesn't exist. Right. I mean, that's not what the governor's governor's proposed uh, uh, since that point in time. What 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 is really going on here? And and. It's a misdirect in the sense that he's trying to beat up on the governor over something that doesn't exist. What what the real problem is, is is getting getting uh, legislative agreement and getting the governor uh, governor agreement on what the replacement revenues are going to be, and the real stumbling block on that on those replacement revenues are the no tax Republicans, and the real leaders of the no tax Republicans. Are Sarah Rasmussen and Kelly Merrick. Right. That's the real core of the problem. If Zach was really concerned about middle and lower income Alaska families, as he as he repeatedly says he is, if he was really concerned about middle and lower income Alaska families, he would be working on a replacement revenue that took the burden off middle and lower income Alaska families and spread it evenly, broadly, among all Alaska families. So all Alaska families chipped in a little bit. And the burden wasn't shoved off on on one particular group as as we've been doing now. Right. The real impediment to achieving that is Merrick and Rasmussen and and Natasha over in the Senate. Those are the real problems 
with with getting equity for middle and lower income Alaska families, not not the governor and not this straw man that they, that Zach's making up about budget cuts. The real problem is getting getting these revenues uh, resolved. But Zach doesn't Zach doesn't take those on. Instead, he just creates this straw man that he can keep, you know, sort of doing a Don Quixote battle with. Uh, uh, in in tilting at the windmill of oh my gosh you know Donna Donna 2.0 right it's just I, it, it's a misdirect and right. it's and it it's a it's a it's a a, a a a unconscionable misdirect in the sense that if he's really concerned about resolving this problem there's other people he needs to be talking about and and he's intentionally not doing that just you know continuing to tilt at this windmill right well it seems like he continues to bring up the old specter the old boogeyman of the 2018 2019 cuts because he just wants to remind people remember this is the same guy that tried to cut everything the apocalypse and the draconian and all the other stuff it seems like he wants to continually bring that up when that's in the past and it's the only thing that he could focus on that he can really win on he doesn't want to focus on these things like you say because then he'd have to make the hard choices which seems to be a typical problem with most legislators at this point it is and 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 and, and you know to go back to our first segment for for just a moment the governor ought to be bashing on Zach for doing that Zach you're 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 not coming at the right issue you're 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 living in the past you're you're trying to create bo- a boogeyman is a good a good word you're trying to create a boogeyman that doesn't exist anymore let's talk about the real issue let's talk about getting at uh, uh, a, a, an agreement on on these revenues let's talk about the people who are standing in the way uh, of doing that uh, but you know since the governor's not doing since the governor's not you know doing that he's since the governor's not confronting the issue you get Zach and other legislators walk you know wandering off talking about other things because they don't have to confront the real issue. The governor hasn't forced them to, the governor hasn't forced them to deal with it. Were you as just, I mean, I was laughing so hard when I was reading this article. I mean, I read through it. I got a little irritated. Then I went back and read it again. And I just had to le- I had to laugh this. I mean, it's just so blatantly, I mean, I don't even want to say blatantly partisan. It almost seems like somebody's throwing a snit, you know, it's it. it, it and, and again, the hypocrisy of the whole thing is just astonishing to me. I think hypocrisy is a is a good word. Um, Zach is sort of beating up on a straw man. He, they they create they've created this straw man, uh, and and they're beating up for straw woman in the case of Donna, and and they're they're beating up on it, and they're not confronting the thing that that really is standing in the way of of getting the PFD done, and it's just I mean it, hypocrisy is the right word. He's, yeah. He's 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 you know trying to misdirect people from the from the true problem. Well, and that really is that's par for the course based on some of the other things we're going to be covering this morning. That seems to be the uh, that seems to be the battle plan uh, to come up against this. It's all about misdirection. Brad, you want to finish up on anything on number two before we move on to number three? <laughs> I, I do. I this is sort of a plague on both your houses. We we have we have now you know. During the first segment and over the over the break, we've sort of beaten up on the governor a lot, but it's the Democrats' fault too. The Democrats aren't facing reality either. They want to go fight, you know, the last battle uh, uh, against uh, against the 2019 governor, the governor who did try to cut uh, spending. They want to keep, you know, beating that dead horse over and over and over again because they're in campaign mode. Also, what if if they were truly interested in the solution? What they would be saying is, we've got to come to, to new revenues. We, we need the governor to lead on on revenues, replacement revenues, but we but we've got to come to replacement revenues. And those anti-taxers in the legislature, like Merrick and Rasmussen, are standing in the way of doing that. And so, as much as we beat up on the governor for you know for not following through and being serious about coming up with a solution, the same thing's true about the Zach Fields, you know group of Democrats. Right. They're not being being realistic. They're they're you know they're off in their own campaign mode trying to trying to flog a a, a dead horse to <laughs> you know to to whip up whip up their base. Right. Pe- people have got to if, if we're truly going to resolve this problem, people have got to come to the middle. They've got to start talking about what kind of replacement revenues we're going to have. And Zach Fields is not doing it and Zach Fields in 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 failing to do it 
is is abandoning the very people that he says he's looking out for the middle and lower income Alaska families. This this tactic that he takes uh, the, this tactic that he's taking of continuing to beat up on the 2019 governor's budget uh, is uh, is just you know is, is just setting the stage for continued PFD cuts because we have no place else to go. Right. The legislature has no no other revenues to use to to plug the hole. Well, and you can see that this tactic is being used by everybody. Your number three is this is this piece. Uh, I almost said opinion piece. This piece by James Brooks in the ADN, which uh, uh, which headlines without the broad agreement on Alaska state budget, high schoolers could lose scholarships and rural Alaska prices may double. Gasp! I mean, it's this discussion talking about, of course, the reverse sweep and the PCE and everything else. Um, but you could see this is the tactic that they're going to take to try and fight back. This is the bludgeon that they're going to try to use against any politician, any Republican, any minority member, any pro pfd -er who wants to, again, utilize the reverse sweep as leverage, which I said, that's the only leverage you got. Peter Machicki said, well, they should just vote no and get it good. I think it's still leverage. And you could see how they are afraid of it. This is the story. And I mean, I think James Brooks, although he's a brilliant writer many times, there are times when somebody just hands him talking points and he writes up an article. That's what this seems like to me. Yeah, it's exactly right. And 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 they're and this is going to be the pitch they're going to use to try to pressure the the, the minority R's into voting for the reverse sweep. Here here's the deal. This this headline is wrong. The the the, the premise of the of the of the storyline is wrong. Voting against the reverse sweep does not defund the 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 secondary education or the 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 higher education uh, fund or the PCE. Those are two entirely, those can be two entirely different things. The way that the budget is usually constructed is that PCE and the higher education fund are paid out of those designated funds that are recreated when the reverse sweep is done. But it doesn't have to be done that way. Right. What you, you've got funds, you've got, you've got funds sitting there that are in those designated accounts you can you can take those funds out put them into the cbr uh, or you can take those funds out and direct a portion of those funds to pay for higher edge the higher education amounts and the pce amounts in fy22 and then fail to reverse sweep the remainder you can make this a future issue as opposed to as opposed to a current issue the way the way that that Bert and others want to construct it is they want to construct it as you know an, an all or nothing that you either vote for the reverse sweep or you're or you're cratering uh, cratering the higher education and the right. PCE programs. Well, but it, it it doesn't have that's that's a that's a arbitrary construction in the budget. The money's there. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be constructed in that way. You can just use the money to fund them for FY22 and then sweep the remainder of the funds into the general funds uh, by failing to do the reverse sweep. So this is, this is an artificial issue that gets created, as you say, to try to put pressure on the minority Republicans. Yeah, absolutely, because the bottom line is, is that if the reverse sweep fails, it doesn't mean that none of these things get funded. It means that all of these things are now equally vying for the same dollars as every other program. That's the thing. Every, all these things would still be available. You would just have to argue for them and fight for them like you would for any other program like the PFD, for example, or highway funding or fill in the blank. Any other program out there. This just stops the automatic guaranteed. It'll be taken care of with no questions asked. That's all it does. But they act as if if you vote against a reverse sweep, these programs are gone forever. You're never going to see another dollar. And that is the false argument, that, like you said, a construct. Uh, but this is and it's been very effective for them over the years. But this is all it does. If, if the PFD has to compete for the dollars, like you say that, oh, it's got to compete for every then everything should have. That's why there's no dedicated funds. And the one thing that he wrote in this article, which I thought was very interesting, was that he said, but lawmakers have long used a procedural workaround to preserve funding for favored projects. It's a, it, they admit it's a workaround for the Constitution. That is mind-blowing that they just acknowledge, oh, it's a workaround. You know, they're not dedicated funds. They're designated funds. There's a difference there. It's all a construct. Yeah. The, the, one, the, the one thing that I, I, I'm a little 
disappointed in is he's, he quotes Kathy Tilton in the article as saying, uh, you know, we, we favor the Republicans favor these programs. This is just a negotiation tool. I think that I think that discussion with Kathy would have been a perfect opportunity for Kathy to say, look, we're not doing away with these programs. We support these programs. We want them in the FY22 budget. What we don't want to have, what, we, what we're concerned about is having these designated funds that perpetually, you know, always churn out money for this as opposed to going through the, the, the competition process of right. whether that's what, are we, what we want to be spending our money on next year. We're prepared to vote for them in FY22. We just don't. We just. We just are concerned about continuing to put them back into designated funds. That ought to be the Republican to me. That ought to be the Republican minority response right. to that. We're 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 going to vote for these funds in the FY22 budget. The question is whether we continually, you know, set them aside. We don't think that's the right thing to do. We're voting against that. We're not right. voting against putting them in the FY22 budget. Yeah, she should have said the minority doesn't oppose these programs. We just want them to be, you know, in a, on an equal playing field and competing for the dollars like every other program that's out there, every other viable, useful, and good program out there. That's what she should have said. And yep. and and they didn't. They, she lost. They, she lost an opportunity there. And I think if this is the tack they're going to take, the Republicans are going to have to get a lot sharper on their responses to this with the media. We got less than sixty seconds, Brad. Final thoughts. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Michael. I think that's the opportunity Republicans have to 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 create the message that pushes back on headlines like this and 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 demonstrates that these headlines are false. That Republicans do favor these programs. They just want them to compete. And I think that is the important part. I mean, again, because they said the Democrats have said and others have said, oh, we just want the PFD to compete with all these other good programs that are out there. Well, if that's the case, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. They should all be competing at this point, including the PCE and the Higher Education Endowment Fund. This is the problem, Brad. I think, you know, look, the, the Democrats and the anti-PFD crowd have an ace in the hole because they've got the media pretty much sewn up, with the exception of Suzanne Downing, who's not always on target. She she is most of the time, but, you know, not all. she gets sometimes lets her partisan views get a little bit too far into it. Uh, but the, the, the media is, is essentially in the pocket of the Democratic uh, coalition and really of the anti-PFD crowd. That's, I mean, they're, they're in there. And so unless the minority members and the pro-PFD uh, conservatives get in there and find a way to basically frame this argument in a way that, that shows, as you said, the fallacy of these articles – then there's no you got to counteract this narrative. You've got to be sharper on this stuff, uh, otherwise you're going to get killed. Yeah, it's all about framing. I mean, I, I'm reminded of of an exchange between Senator Hoffman and Senator Ron Imhoff, first in the Finance Committee, Senate Finance Committee, and then on the floor in the budget debate. Natasha always presses the presses this argument that. Uh, you know, the, 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 if we have to tax, we're going to have to tax for the PFD because the PFD is the last dollar uh, in the budget. And if we have to raise additional revenues, it's really we're raising additional revenues to fund the PFD. Lyman pushed back and said, no, that's you're just framing. You're trying to frame the issue to favor your argument. In fact, according to the according, as, as Lyman said on the floor, according to the intent behind the PFD, legislative intent at the time, the explanation of the PFD, it was to be the first dollar. And if you're going to have to tax the first dollar out of, out of the ERA, and if you're going to have to tax uh, uh, to, to, to raise revenues, you're taxing to pay for government, you're not taxing to pay for the PFD. It's all in the framing. And, 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 and the, the, the challenge is that Natasha's gotten away with her framing. Uh, Lyman's only really started to push back this year. And, and on the reverse sweep, the, the majority is getting away with the framing again, uh, uh, as picked up in the, in the James Brooks article. The, the minority needs to do a good job of reframing the issue. All the facts are there. I mean, the, the, you can say the money's there. We're going to vote for it in the FY22 budget. We're just not going to agree to continue designating these funds. It's going to have to compete going forward. But no, no parent should be concerned about Johnny not getting his college scholarship funded in FY22. No village should be concerned about you know their 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 utilities doubling in FY22. We're prepared to vote for those line items in the budget. It's just that we're not prepared prepared to continue to set them aside uh, until we get until we get some long term. Uh, a resolution uh, to to our budget issue, 
And, and the minority has an opportunity, I think, to reframe the issue in that way to follow up on, on what Kathy said about, you know, being supportive of these programs. But they've got to do it. I mean, they've, they've got to reframe the issue. They've got to articulate it. They've got to push it. Uh, uh, when uh, when they get interviewed or in their press releases or in their in their individual statements, they've got to take the opportunity to reframe the issue uh, in a positive way. You know, on a side note, again, I, James Brooks has written some good articles, um, and and I think he's a good reporter. But I think that we have a problem overall with journalism in this state, and maybe in other states, but mostly in this state, where it seems like. There's just not the both sides of the argument. I mean, he quotes Kathy Tilton uh, in one little paragraph down here. But the rest of the article is basically everybody on the opposing side throwing all this shade and, and again, framing the argument about, uh, you know, it, it's a it's a black or white this or that kind of thing. And it just doesn't seem to be that that take on the on the on the equitability and that's a problem that we have in this state it seems with coverage and the problem is is the most people don't look deeper than the news coverage and that's part of our problem here i think it's aside from politics is that we've kind of lost that journalistic you know craig medred dig into both sides of it take it you know take it from both positions kind of uh, journalism yeah but i think part of that michael is due to the lack of of solid framing and uh, uh, reframing or, or contrary framing or, or more positive framing on the other side. I mean, if, if, if the Republicans had framed the issue in the way you and I just discussed as a, as a positive, we're so for these programs, we're going to vote for them in FY22. Nobody should be concerned. What we're really concerned about, what we're really trying to do is deal with the long-term, long-term fiscal situation. If, if they had that framing, then in this interview, Kathy could have pushed back with that framing. And and one thing James is James is fair at is he's fair at quoting people. He's fair at, you know, when he asks somebody a question, they give him a response. He's fair at including it in the article. So it's y- yes, he's not he's he's not doing the job of framing the argument for them. Uh, uh, he's you know, he's just quoting what they're saying. The minority, I think, both on on this issue and as Lyman started to do on the PFD issue, the the, the minorities need to do better at framing their arguments and then pushing that reframing uh, uh, in in the discussions, as opposed to just letting right. what, whatever the majority says sort of set the tone and then they're just reacting to it. No, we don't believe that. I mean, it's no. it's it's <clears throat> you, you've got to have a positive framing them and then be pushing that. No, Lyman Hoffman's comment I thought was so uh, was so succinct and so. I mean, I wish he'd made it you know four years ago. I wish he'd made this argument four years ago, but it is so important, and I think that should be the cornerstone of every argument that the minority and the pro-PFD Republicans in the Senate make, that it's supposed to be the first take, everything should be equitable, but that according to the according to the to these to the intent and the statute and the and the and the law, it should be the first take. Everything else should be equitable. And no, it doesn't mean we don't want to spend. It just means that everything should be on the table. And I think that should be the key and the cornerstone of every argument that these folks are making. And it just seems like they're just they've never been as good as the anti-PFD Republicans and the and the Democratic uh, majority in making those things happen. Twenty seconds now. Yeah, it, it's all in the framing. They've, they've, the, it's important to get the message down. I don't think the minority has done a good job doing that. But this is an opportunity to get better uh, and to push back on it. And I think we're going to see that coming up in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, the reverse sweep debate, an opportunity for them to, to be better at the argument. Hopefully they'll do it. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. I'm going to go take an Advil now. <laughs> Michael, as always, <laughs> thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.